Bowie. Hi, this is David Bowie, and uh, welcome to Top of the Pops 2. I think it was like there were real nuggets. Anything on rock and roll seemed to be... There seemed to be so little of it that when it did appear on television, um, it seemed like the most... Uh, like the Holy Grail, especially if it was from America. They'd show a, a clip from a, a movie. I remember getting so excited when they showed Little Richard from... Uh, I think the film was called Disc Jockey Jamboree. And uh, it was just amazing to actually see him moving, you know, because I hadn't seen the movie. I just saw this clip of him. And he'd just been a record to me before, you know. I got my photographs of him from uh, the New Musical Express. Do you remember that magazine? Uh, and uh, it was, there was an advert in the back for Star Zone photographs. And I think it was about two and sixpence or something. And so I sent for two photographs of uh, Little Richard. And I only got one. So I lost half a crown. I got one, and that one was torn. I was so pissed. And I put sellotape on it, and I stuck it, because I you know, didn't think about sending it back, because I thought I'd never see it again if I sent it back. So I've still got it. That's one of the few things I got from the, that far in the past. My picture of Little Richard with sellotape on. Same bit of yellow sellotape. <laughs> I guess Thursday's Child is somebody He's somebody that um, maybe felt that he'd achieved anything that he was ever going to achieve in his life, which wasn't very much, um, and that the way forward looked as bleak as much of his past had done, and that it was uh, uh, maybe an overpowering sense of uh, dispassion in his life until it was changed by meeting this uh, particular person that he falls in love with. So it's like his glimmer of uh, uh, a glimmer of salvation in his own life. Pops in 1972. I think we were excited uh, when I, uh, when we went back as the Spiders to do Starman, because we kind of knew that what we were doing was like singularly different to anything else that was happening. So there was that kind of frisson, you know, that sense of anticipation that we were unleashing this thing on the world. All the bravado of being in your twenties. Uh, I was a young songwriter, and I was very keen to write songs. In fact, I, I think I almost thought that I would end up being a writer of musicals at the time, in the 60s. I really I hadn't made up my mind whether I was going to do sort of solo work as a singer, writer, or whether I was going to stay more in the background and, and, and kind of write things for stage with songs in them. Um, and I had a publisher in uh, London who sent me... Uh, uh, sent me a French song, Comme d'habitude. You have to do it from here, I think. Comme d'habitude. Uh, and he said, but do you want to try and supply an English lyric to this? And I said, yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, that'd be good exercise. So I wrote a lyric for it called uh, Even a Fool Learns to Love, or <laughs> some such drivel. It was really ropey. Uh, but I thought I'd make a few bob out of it. <laughs> but I didn't. Uh, he said, yeah, thank you. This is really terrible. <laughs> I'm giving it to somebody else. Next thing I heard, it, would, it had been done, uh, rewritten again by uh, Paul Anker, and it came back as my way, and Sinatra had done it. I was so pissed. I thought, I could, I'll could, write my own then. So I wrote Life on Mars. <laughs> when I was making hours, um, I wanted some sense of the past. I wanted some uh, sense of the... Uh, the style of writing that I might have started off with, you know, that many years ago. Uh, I didn't really want to duplicate that, the early 70s period at all, so it just reflects on it. It's not supposed to be a, a sort of a retro feel to it. Um, but I wanted to... Uh, I, I, I wanted to create the album with more conventional, traditional songwriting forms, you know. So there's very little experimentation in the studio. A lot of it was just uh, straightforward songwriting. So I enjoy, I enjoy that. I still like working in that way. I'd come back from New York having uh, uh, caught one of the last uh, performances of the Velvet Underground, who I had admired tremendously since uh, around 66, 67. I was one of that tiny bastion of uh, Velvet Underground fans in, in London at the time, before they were kind of generally known. Uh, and I'd gotten into the Electric Circus to see the gig. The Electric Circus is a, a very famous uh, rock club in New York, which is 
that subsequently closed. I think it must have closed in the 70s. And uh, I, I watched the entire show, and there were not many people in the audience because their, you know, their kind of their star had begun to dim in New York. Uh, and uh, I saw, you know, the whole band were there with Lou Reed singing the songs up front and all that. And I thought it, it was just tremendous, and I was singing along with the band, stuck right there at the apron of the stage, waiting for the man. La, la, la. White light, white hair, uh, heroin. La, la, la. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of stuff. And then during the break, actually, no, at the end of the show, I went backstage and I knocked on the door. And John Cale came to the door and I said, is Lou Reed in there? I'd like, love to talk. I'm from England and I'd love to talk because I'm in music too. And I went, and he's a bit of a hero to me. You know? He said, uh, mm, wait here, he said. And so Lou comes out and we're sitting outside talking on the bench for about a quarter of an hour about writing songs and what it's like to be Lou Reed and all that. And afterwards, I, I was floating on a cloud and went back to my hotel. And the, the guy that I knew in New York, uh, whilst I was over here, I said, I've just seen the Velvet Underground. I got to talk with Lou Reed for 15 minutes. He said, yeah. He said, Lou Reed left the band last year. I said, I think you've been done. I said, well, who was that? He said, what did it look like? I said, it looked just like Lou Reed. He said, well, that's Doug Yule. He's the guy that took over from Lou Reed. I thought, what an imposter. Wow, that's incredible. It doesn't matter, really, because I still talk to Lou Reed, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and coming back to England, one of the things, one of the memories I brought back was the, uh, was all that. So uh, uh, I wrote uh, Queen Bitch as a kind of a, an homage to uh, Velvet Underground. <laughs> Survive is probably my favourite one of the two favourite new songs from uh, the Hours album. Uh, there's something I, I really find authentically uh, uh, early 70s about the writing structure of Survive. And it's a joy to sing on stage. It's probably one of the favourites of the new songs to actually perform. Pressure was the video I never made. <laughs> I think there was an assemblage job on that one. Uh, it was actually, I didn't know Queen very well. I, I knew Roger, the drummer, quite well, but I, I didn't really know Freddie. Um, but he was in the neighbourhood where I lived in Switzerland, and they, they owned the studio down there at Mountain. And they were in over a, a week's period, and uh, I just popped in one night, and somehow or other we ended up writing this thing together, as, as usually happens when musicians get together. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased I did it. It was nice to be part of it.